Well, my dear friends, as of a few hours ago, I officially have 50,000 subscribers to this channel, and I can't even begin to tell you how happy that makes me feel. So, how can I show my appreciation to all of you? Well, I guess the best thing is just to keep on reading more stories. Let's start with a great one this evening. Now, this is part of a series. I haven't done the ones before, but it stands alone as a good story in its own right, so... Give mine a listen, and then check out the other stories. I know some other narrators out there have done a really good job on the earlier stories in this one. And if you like it, I will continue reading this one later on. Now then, you know what time it is. Time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Oh, I'd reached a low point in my life. I'd lost my job, my wife, my kids, my house. And I decided that losing my life would nicely round off an epic run of bad luck. So with that in mind, I got up early one morning, around quarter past five, and headed down to a part of the river where the water ran darkest and deepest. It was a pretty popular place as suicides. And there were all these signs posted along the way that urged people to think twice before they went ahead with it. I crossed a small steel bridge that spanned the river at its narrowest point. The locals called it Troll Bridge. I reached the halfway mark, and climbing over the railing, I hung on with both hands, my back to the river, listening to the waters rushed past beneath me. I can't remember having second thoughts. All I remember is falling backwards, the sky tilting away from me, and then the shock of impact. Water exploded around me, the world dissolving into a maelstrom of bubbles and black foam. And I remember trying to breathe, the panic screaming in my head, lungs burning. Jesus! One sweet breath was all I craved, struggling to live even as I struggled to die and begging God to make it quick. There was this howling in my head, a rushing sensation in my body, and images of my life kept flashing past like movies arranged on a massive carousel, and there was this woman whispering in my ear, It's okay. It's okay, Miles. We're going home, honey. Don't be scared now. I thought, maybe... She was my mother. Maybe she was waiting for me on the other side. And then, everything was fading away. Everything was going dark. I opened my eyes. Studio lights are ranked above me, bright as a seizure, and instinctively I jerk my hand up to shield my eyes. I'm still wheezing dragging big, sodden gaps of air in, and I'm rolling onto my side, throwing up river water as my entire body goes into a painful series of spasms I can't stop vomiting. In the distance I hear a shitload of people cheering and clapping over the sound of crappy, generic TV game show music, and this voice is booming over a mic. Always on air, always live, even when we're dead. Come on, folks, raise the roof and give me some love. This is Mr. P, the big man on Channel 666. This is the show that literally raises the dead, just so we can kill them fuckers all over again. I lowered my hands from my eyes and squinted as I looked around. I was in some kind of huge holding cell, more like an animal cage with dried straw quilting the ground and a thick red canopy thrown over the rusting bars that formed a square around myself and my fellow prisoners. I couldn't see what lay outside the cage, but I could see there were maybe fifteen other people in there with me, all huddled over in one corner and whispering like they were shit scared someone was going to hear them, and a few of them were sobbing, and one or two were on their knees with arms thrown wide, as though praying for deliverance. Hey, what's going on? I approached them cautiously. They all seemed to hush me at the same time, 
jerking their fingers to their lips and making a loud shh sound. And it was surreal the way that they did that, all at once, like 15 people all hooked into the same nervous system. Where are we? A man stepped out of the shadows to my left and slowly shuffled towards me. You got to win for your sin, boy, he crooned. Gotta beat the odds. <laughs> beat the odds. I stood staring at him, not quite understanding what I was seeing. The skin had literally been peeled from the man's face. His features were red ruin and white sinew, but he was grinning, his teeth eerily white against a landscape of red ruin, and it was a dead man's grin, like the muscles of his face had cramped around that single, ghastly expression. Gotta beat the odds to please the gods, man, he growled. We are all here by choice. I was slowly backing away from him when I sensed someone moving up behind me. I turned. It was a girl with no eyes. They weren't missing, they just weren't there. Like she'd been born with skin and bone where I should have been. And she was slowly groping her way towards me. The way a blind person sometimes gropes when they're in unfamiliar territory. I killed my ma, she said in a little girl's voice. And then I done for me, mister. Do you think I'm pretty? I avoided her touch the way I would have avoided the touch of a contagion. Where the fuck am I? My voice was loud and jittery with nerves. You don't know? The man with no face said. Can't you guess? You're on TV, mister. <laughs> You're famous. The group in the corner of the cage all started shaking at the bars making this weird keening sound that sent tentacles of disquiet scurrying up my spine. I'd never heard anything so creepy. They sounded like backing vocals at a black mass. You're famous, mister, voices whispered to me out of the darkness. You're dead famous. There was a harsh rattling sound and a door in the cage swung open and instantly a small mob of dwarves swarmed in through the opening. The dwarves were all wearing these silicon masks with huge chins and perfectly waxed hairdos. The fact the masks were all grinning was pretty goddamned unsettling, but the eyes of those masks had been cut away and you could see the dwarves' real eyes glaring out of those holes. Their eyes, coupled with that huge cartoon-like grin, really freaked me out. What the fuck is going on? I screamed at them. They were holding on to this huge red fire hose that they hauled into the cage with them, and taking aim at me with the nozzle, they sent out this enormous jet of water that knocked me clean off my feet. I was yelling and struggling, one arm thrown up in front of my face as I tried to get back to my feet, but my legs kept going out from beneath me, and I rolled and spluttered and gasped as the dwarves hosed me out of the cage, driving me in front of them like a pig being steered towards slaughter. A voice was booming from nowhere and everywhere. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Miles Josh, formerly of Dayton, Ohio, a man who recently killed himself when he lost his job, lost his lady, lost his kids. Jesus. All around loser, this guy. A little fairy tells me he never found a thing in life he didn't manage to lose five minutes later. I heard the sound of an audience laughing as the dwarves drove me on. Oh, but we're going to give him another chance, the voice continued. Give him the opportunity to redeem himself. Because on Game for Suicides, everyone gets another spin of the wheel. Big cheer. The audience, wherever they were, was loving it. The dwarves stopped hosing me forward. And I stood there, wiping water from my eyes and looking around. I was standing in an enormous studio with lights blazing down from the ceiling. 
and colours as bright as a freaking migraine, and a pair of enormous red curtains sealing off part of the set. And right in front of me was an audience of tens of thousands. I'd never seen so many people in so tight a space, sitting in ascending tiers of seats and all of them glaring down at me. They looked hungry for spectacle. To the left of me, a group of four contestants stood behind flashing podiums, and right in front of me, standing on a small elevated stage, was a guy I could only assume was the host. He was just the way you described him, Nick. A big guy in a tight, checkered suit, and a bow tie and this humongous chin. And he was flanked by two really tall, skinny chicks with big, toothy smiles and blank, sideways blinking eyes. The host was ushering me towards an empty podium, and the dwarves hit me with another blast of water that knocked me on my back. I got the message, and picking myself up, I scrambled towards the empty podium and stood behind it. Well, he's not <laughs> quite dead the host roared. But let's just say he is, shall we? So, well done, Miles, and welcome to the other side. He stared down at me. Any regrets? W where am I? I demanded, squinting into the glare of half a dozen spotlights. What is this place? The audience roared with laughter, as though I'd said something really funny. Where are you? The host squeaked. Where are you? Why? Dear boy, you're on game for suicides, and I'm your host, Mr. Pontiac. But you can call me. He held up his microphone, as if this were a cue. The audience roared, Mr. P. I turned to look at my fellow contestants. Seated right beside me was this guy with rolls of cellophane wrapped so tight around his head that there was no possible way he could breathe. I could barely make out his features at all, beneath all that shrink wrapping, but I got the impression he was staring at me. On the other side of him was a man wearing a mask made of what looked like human skin. The mask was sewn onto his real face, and his eyes were bristling with three-inch needles. The third contestant was a woman with a face composed of a single, convulsive scream. All mouth, all teeth, a bloodshot eye staring out of her throat. Her skin was blue-black, and there was a noose around her neck pulled tight. The final contestant was a human doll. A big man in a nightdress, wearing a creepy plastic Barbie mask. No expression beneath waves of fake blonde hair. Just these huge blank eyes staring out at the world. God damn, I got me a heart off of this round, Mr. Pontiac was yelling. I smell fresh meat, new blood. Anyone smell that? Hmm, tangy aroma, like hot piss and licorice. That's the smell of the freshly dead, hmm, like new mown grass, like freshly turned earth. I ain't dead, me. I ain't. There's been some kind of mix-up. The woman with a noose around her neck was protesting. No mix-ups, no mistakes. Only the dead qualify for this show, sister. Only the dear departed get a shot at. He held his microphone up again, and the audience howled. Game for suicides! Reading off a bunch of cue cards, Mr. P started throwing questions at us that made no kind of sense that I could figure out, but the other contestants were hitting their buzzers like he was asking regular questions on a regular game show. For three points, what is a bride? Zzzd, to be wed. For two points, why is a groom? Zzzd, to shoot a dead. Two points, why is the bridesmaid? Zzzd, to offer an alibi. One point. Why is an in-law? I had had enough. I hit my buzzer, and Mr. Pontiac glared expectantly at me. I don't know, I yelled. That's not a real question. What the fuck does that mean?
Why is an in-law? Why is an in-law? Why is an in-law? Why is a fuck a doodle in-law? <laughs> Mr. Pontiac screamed at me, infuriated that I'd interrupt the flow of his show. But a moment later, he cracked a huge grin and waved an effect hand at me. Why is an in-law? He inquired, in a more jovial tone of voice. Zzz, to attend the inquest, said the guy with cellophane wrapped around his head. His voice was really muffled, and he sounded short of breath. I felt like reaching across and tearing holes in all that cellophane, just so the guy could breathe. Who said Mr. Pontiac. Wrong answer, I'm afraid. The right answer to why is an in-law is to drive you to drink. The audience went, Ooh, and Mr. Pontiac performed this strange little dance, as though he was really pleased the cellophane gay had fucked up. Choose a door, choose a challenge, May the chips lie where they fall, Mr. Pontiac thundered, and the two girls assisting him yanked on a thick cord of rope hanging from the studio ceiling. The huge red curtains covering one side of the set were instantly rolled aside to reveal a corridor that seemed to go on forever, with coloured doors on either side, green doors and red doors and yellow doors, and on and on and on they marched into haze and distance. Ten seconds to choose a door, or you forfeit the round, Mr. Pontiac announced, and before he'd quite finished talking, the cellophane man raced across to the corridor and started listening at each of the doors, trying to determine what lay on the other side, and meantime, the audience was counting down. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. At last, with seconds to spare, the man chose a yellow door, and, yanking it open, he stepped through. I had to look up to the huge monitor hanging overhead to see what happened next. The cellophane man had stepped into a giant nursery filled with Victorian-style cribs, and in each crib, I assumed a baby was sleeping. The floor of the nursery was booby-trapped with tripwires attached to a series of overhead bells. One wrong move, I guessed and the bells would start ringing, and the babies would wake up crying. And then, what? The cellophane man obviously didn't want to find out. He moved with extreme caution. The object of the game seemed to be to cross the nursery and exit through another door on the opposite side, without triggering any of the alarms. This proved to be impossible, and it wasn't long before he set off an alarm. The babies woke up, wailing. A massive cleaver arced down from the ceiling and literally sliced the man in half. It happened so fast that the man actually attempted to take another step forward before he separated into two neat halves that fell away from each other. I turned in horror, my gorge rising as I struggled not to throw up. The audience was going wild. Suddenly, I was taking the game a whole lot more seriously. I noticed the lights in the studio had dimmed, and standing there on stage, Mr. Pontiac looked different somehow. Darker. Taller. He stood with his eyes rolled up in his head, and his teeth gritted, and his hands clenched into fists. He appeared to be shaking, as though a powerful surge of electricity was driving up through him. And presently, he issued a cry, caught midway between a shriek and an animal's howl. The audience fell silent, as the studio was filled with the echo of that howl. I am the eater of souls, Mr. Pontiac roared. I stand at the crossroads between heaven and hell, and I shall have my pound of pearly flesh. The studio spotlight swung back to illuminate me and my fellow contestants. A replacement contestant was hosed on stage by the dwarves and forced to join us. He looked pretty normal until he turned his head away from me. 
I winced when I noticed the back of his skull was completely missing, like it had been blown away by a shotgun blast. I started thinking that maybe all these people were suicides, that maybe I was in some kind of afterlife and this game was our punishment for taking what we'd thought was the easy way out. For five points, why is a pill Zzzd, to swallow? Three points, why is a swallow? I hit the buzzer. Mr. Pontiac glared at me. If I'm dead already, I said, then how the hell can you kill me again? Ooh, good answer, Mr. Pontiac howled. There's no flies on Miles, ladies and gentlemen. He's a regular brain box. The audience cheered. I'm not playing your shit game, I told him. I'm dead and there's nothing you can threaten me with, Mr. P. So I'm going to go out on a limb and call your entire show one big fucking hoax. The audience had started to jeer at me, but I didn't care. I was surprised to see a second Mr. Pontiac stroll up on stage. He was identical to the first, except he was wearing a tie, and the first Mr. Pontiac was wearing a dicky bow. The two Mr. Pontiacs stood there, conversing with each other in low tones. Every now and then they'd glance in my direction. They didn't look happy. The second Mr. P looked as though he could cheerfully have ripped my entrails out and strangled me with them. You shouldn't get mad like that, said the shotgun man. They can get really mean. Oh, fuck em, I said. I'm dead. That ought to give me some leverage around here. The shotgun man shrugged. You shouldn't get mad like that, he said again in exactly the same tone of voice. They can get really mean. Where are we? I asked him. You're in a televised corner of hell, the man said. Great ratings. Everyone's a goddamn star. And you're right, you can't die, not over here. They just revive you and you're back in the game again. How long have you been here? The man thought about this. Is Ronald Reagan still president? He asked. I shook my head, dumbfounded. Christ, the poor guy had been here about 30 years. I couldn't imagine a face worse than that. Well, my boy, the bow tie wearing Mr. Pontiac thundered, and turning, I saw he was addressing me. His twin had vanished, and he was gazing across at me with eyes that turned completely black. <laughs> the management like your spirit, he growled. They think you got a certain something, so we're gonna offer you a deal. Go on, I invited him. Elimination round. Sudden death. You win, you go free. You lose. And I eat your fucking soul. The audience thought this was a solid deal and cheered approval. I'm not afraid of you, I told him. Oh, you will be, you little fucker do. I gripped my teeth. Let's do it. I snarled. For three points then, I take my place amongst the rulers of the world. Who am I? I answered without really thinking about it. Madness. You vote for me every five years. Who am I? Fear. You worship me even though I don't deserve it. Who am I? Celebrity. I am the Prince of Psychopaths. What's my name? Satan. Oh, sorry. Wrong answer. The right answer is Frank from Delaware. So, off you go, Miles. Choose a door. Choose a fate. And may the chips lie where they fall. His assistants yanked on the ropes and the huge red curtain sailed sideways revealing that endless passage of colored doors. Ten seconds, Mr. Pontiac grinned at me. Choose a door, my boy, or your soul will be singing falsetto in hell. 
I got up and walked towards the corridor as the audience began to chant the countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven. I chose a blue door, swung it open and stepped right through. This is a dream. I was convinced. They can't really hurt me. I found myself standing in the kind of living room you found in those old homesteads way out west. You know the type. Stone fireplace, wooden rafters, a stag's head mounted on the wall, and a pair of Winchester rifles crisscrossed above the flag of Texas. A real frontier home. It even smelled of pinewood and gun polish. I saw no immediate danger here. There was an old grandmother sitting in a rocking chair by the fireplace. She was knitting, and there was a good-sized fire blazing in the hearth beside her. The rocking chair creaked as the granny rocked back and forth, and her needles clicked like insect mandibles as she knitted. She looked about ninety. An old radio sat beside her, playing Edith Piaf's La Vie en Rose, the song accompanied by the crackling sound of vinyl. Across the room there was a door with a sign hung on it that read, Way out, fuckadoo. I was about to head towards the door when, all at once, the music stopped, and instantly the granny was on her feet, sniffing the air and swinging her head back and forth like a two-legged bloodhound. And Jesus, did she move fast. One moment she was sitting peacefully in that rocking chair, the next moment she was standing, primed for action. That's when I noticed she had no eyes. Where her eyes should have been, there were smaller versions of her mouth teeth snapping and grinding, and her actual mouth was huge. It literally split the lower part of her face in two, with steel teeth bared and glinting as she sniffed at the air. My skin went cold at the sight of her. I realized that, if I made the slightest sound, that creature would be on me in a split second. The music started up again, and slowly the granny sank back down on the rocking chair and resumed knitting. I breathed a sigh and started across the room as carefully and as quietly as I could. I was about a quarter of the way into the room when the music stopped again and instantly the old woman was on her feet and sniffing at the air. I froze. I stood there for about half a minute watching that monster swing its head blindly back and forth its three mouths gaping wide, a blood-red tongue sliding out of each and licking parched lips. I started moving again as soon as the music resumed, and the granny settled back to her knitting. I was almost there. Four more steps and I'd reach the exit. I was beginning to think I'd make it. When the music stopped and, simultaneously, a floorboard creaked beneath my foot. I winced and turned to see if the granny had been alerted, only to see her coming at me with the speed of a mountain lion, her steel teeth snapping, the smaller mouth stretched wide like black gaping holes in her head, and I was so shocked I stumbled back with a wild cry, throwing an arm up to defend myself. Her teeth closed around my forearm, and the pain was excruciating. I screamed in agony and lashed out at her punching her repeatedly in the head, but I couldn't loosen her grip. She was growling like an animal, and I remember her strength was incredible. She was literally driving me back against the wall, and I just had the presence of mind to reach up and snatch one of those revolvers down, and sticking the barrel into one of those gaping mouths, I pulled the trigger. The back of her head exploded, and she dropped like a sack of potatoes, and bleeding heavily from my forearm, I crossed the rest of the room, flung the exit door open, and barged through. I opened my eyes, choking and gasping for breath. And there was a man crouched over me, and he was grinning from ear to ear. Jesus, he said. I thought you was a goner. I leaned over and threw up a gallon of water, and then I gasped, what happened? I fished you out of the river, the man said. I think maybe you was trying to kill yourself, 
but that ain't for me to say. I looked around. I was lying by the river and the troll bridge was about ten meters away, and I remember everything. Crossing the bridge and flinging myself into the water, and dying and waking up on that show. And I remembered Mr. Pontiac and all those contestants, and just remembering them, I leaned sideways and I threw up again. Oh, just take it easy, the man said. You've been through one hell of a wash and rinse. I've never been so happy to be alive. <laughs> I told him so. <laughs> You're a lucky son of a bitch, he agreed. But we gotta get you to a hospital. Looks like you cut yourself on something. Looking down at my forearm, I saw what he was pointing at. The bloody tooth marks of that old woman had punctured my flesh. Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. I read a story, forgot its name. Back again on Wednesday. Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. <laughs> okay, I'll be back with you again soon. Sorry about that, couldn't resist. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>